I'm Gavin Clark with the National Museum of Computing and Reading Museum and we're interviewing former employees and customers of Digital Equipment Corp as part of the 60th anniversary of DEC opening its first offices in the UK. It's March the 8th 2024 and we are at the National Museum of Computing. I hear, I'm here today talking to Pete Lomas. Pete, please, let's start with the basics. Tell us your full name, your place and your year of birth. So I'm Pete Lomas. Uh, I was born in Salford, which is next to Manchester in the UK. Uh, regretfully, 1955, so it's quite a long time ago, and certainly before computers. So what was your fam family background and your kind of early education? Yeah, Who so, were your parents? So, I mean, you know, Let's just say what it is. I mean, basically, we lived in a near slum in the middle of Salford. My father was an electrician, in fact, a former electrician for Wimpy's, the construction industry. They still sort of exist today. He worked all hours, God sends, really, to keep food on the table and also to get us out of there as, as quickly as possible. Uh, so, you know, I just went to a, a regular school, uh, which was close by, and then we moved we moved out to a place called Pendlebury, uh, which was, you know, we had our then our own house and he spent almost his life adding to it, adding garages and extra rooms and things. Um, but I suppose being an electrician, that was, the electricity was a thing that was sort of ran in the family and bits of wire and bulbs and that. Uh, but when it really started for me was when I, I think I was about 13 and I, I could then go into Manchester on my own on the bus. And I'm sure you'll realise that sort of Manchester had a massive computing culture from the Ferrantes, the ICLs and all the cast off bits of electronics would end up in this place called Shrewd Hill. And I'd go there and just root and look for things and bring things back. So one day I brought back, I think probably reasonably a quarter of a telephone exchange might be the right thing. I, I got some funny looks on the bus, you know, the family were horrified, but I sort of had a plan. I had a plan that I could take all these components and these were relays, diodes, uniselectors and various assorted capacitors and junk around it. I took it all apart, cleaned all the parts, and somehow, and to my embarrassment, I can't remember exactly how I did it, I made a noughts and crosses machine out of it. Now, I didn't realise, but I suppose that was a sort of computer. It was a fixed program computer that played one thing. And uh, I was, I think what it really came down to, I was interested in making things and actually creating things. And so schoolwork was really a, huge challenge for me. I couldn't see the point. It didn't focus on anything that I understood that I would want to do. What kind of things were you being, I suppose, made to learn or what was outside the curriculum you might have been interested in? Well, I mean, you know, we had French and Spanish and there was a very small amount of Latin. Um, there was geography. But the things I was interested in, which was, you know, sort of towards the chemistry, the physics. And the thing I really liked was technical drawing because you could be creative on the page. Um, but then they made me sort of do art, which was draw flower. Now I want to draw you know, sort of mechanical things. And, and that, that really didn't go down too well. So I ended up School just wasn't for me. I just, it just didn't float my boat. And I spent more time building things and also experimenting with chemistry than perhaps I should have done. So I ended up at 16 leaving with some fairly mediocre results. Uh, the top of the tree was technical drawing, as you might expect, then maths, and then sort of gradually de descending order through sort of English lit, um, down to a grade nine fail in French. So what do you do then? I wanted to get out of there because it, I wasn't enjoying it. And I got onto a course, which was an ONC in electrical and a bit of electronics at Bolton Institute of Technology, which is now the University of Bolton. And the reason I went there is because they had stuff. When I went there, they had so much stuff you could actually work with. 
things that you could actually uh, play with and interact with, which was, and that just was like brilliant for me. So did you, did you, did you apply to anywhere else apart from Bolton? Any other options or was straight Bolton for you? Um, it was crazy. I went there and was instantly, I mean, I was instantly attracted to what they did. Were you it, looking for further education? Uh, yeah, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, my great, even then, I think my fear was I'd probably end up as an electrician on a building site. I mean, I'd spent several years with my dad helping to re rewire houses. So I thought, is this my life? But I like making things. This is not quite right. So this is where, this is where I sort of, my first, if you like, skirmish with deck was at college. So describe Bolton Institute of Technology. What is the building and what are the kind of things are going on there? Okay, so the building it is was basically a fairly for then a modern um, building with a big tower with a library in it, and at the back it had um, they were doing things like automotive engineering, electrical engineering, which is I, w I was in. They had an art side, a mechanical engineering side. So it really was a technical college. And in fact, it was one of two in, in Bolton and they were sort of vying with each other for doing the best, the best courses. Um, and really it was the, the electrical engineering, it was all heavy machines, three phase motors, generator sets and all that sort of stuff. And they had a huge lab with all this stuff in. The electronics was a little bit more scaled back, but the course modules had all that sort of stuff in it. But when we're talking about electronics here, we're talking pre-microprocessor. It's all transistors. And in, in fact, in our case, it was still valves. They were still teaching us about valves. So you get some idea of the positioning. So, yeah, so I went there and I'd not seen it on my tour, but on my first day in there, there was this room. And in this room was this sort of, it wasn't a black box exactly, it was a sort of semi-transparent smoked box. As you'll know, the original straight eight PDP-8s came with this sort of smoked perspex cover on the front. And these little orange flashing lights, like, what's this? And so I, I went in to have a look and this guy stopped me, said, yeah, can I help you? And I goes, yeah, I'm just, you know, what's this? And they had a set of teletypes there just humming around in the background. And I go, he says, right, this is a PDP-8. It's our computing uh, facility for the whole college. He said, what course you're on? He said, oh, I'm on an ONC. He said, well, I've got some bad news for you. Uh, it's not part of your curricula. If you were doing the BSc in electrical and electronics, then it would be. I said, so that means we can't, can we not? And he said, no, you can't. And just as I turned on my heels thinking, well, that's a bit of a bummer. He said, I suppose you could always come back at lunchtime because it's not used then. And that was really the start of what, 400 lunchtimes I went back, pretty much every lunchtime I went back. But the first day back, the first time I went, I was excited, but incredibly nervous. He sat me down at a terminal. And of course, you know, people, will, people today don't actually realize what, what I'm talking about, that it's, it looks like an electric typewriter. It sits there, it's sort of humming to itself. And it's sort of inviting you to type something with this little colon, but there's nothing else. There's no prompts, there's no guide, there's nothing. So Graham, that was his name. What was his, come what, back. What was it? Yeah, come. He said this man's name is important, isn't he? Who is this guy? Yeah, this guy. This guy was was Gray was Graham Beach, and he was the technician in charge of that computer and and that segment of the department. And so he had to make sure it kept running and provide assistance to people when they they came to use it. And yeah, he was hugely important because he sat me down at that terminal. And of course, the inevitable first Dartmouth Basic program turns up, which is. 10, print, whatever you want. So I chose Hello World. And then of course it's 20, go to 10. And then he says, right, you just type run. 
to make it go and then it starts spewing hello world out on the printer and it keeps spewing hello world out on the printer and it keeps doing it and he's just standing there actually eating his sandwiches just watching this develop and I'm sure he was you know I started well how do, I tried stop and I tried halt and all the things I could instantly think of I started eyeing up the power thinking that's the only way I'm going to stop this there was a switch on the front that said offline I thought oh great so I switched it to offline and it stopped I thought that was great and then I switched it back online and it just kept doing it again and then, of course, I think he just waited for that bead of sweat on my forehead. And then he just leaned over and just typed control C. And I think that was a magic moment. And it sort of, there was sort of several things in there. One, he'd given me the opportunity to sit down there and write a first program. He'd give me encouragement, like tell him, you know, give me a hint as to what to do. But he'd also given me control because he'd shown me this magic key combination that when your program went completely bananas, that would just stop it. And, and I think that without that, I wouldn't have necessarily got into the computer. But you realise very quickly that if you can write a set of instructions, the computer will do your bidding. He said something important to you. He said, didn't he say that was your first lesson in computing? I, that was absolutely, yeah, that was my first, that was my first computer program. And from there we got ever so, you know, ever so much more complicated. So what happens next? So that was your very first one. So you went back the next day and then the next day at lunchtime? Well, the next day and then um, the next one, of course, was to give me uh, access to the Dartmouth Basic Manual which I read from front cover to back cover twice to understand all the different commands that you've got. And then we had a long conversation. Why, why has it got line numbers that go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50? Well, so you can put other instructions in between. And this whole thing about being able to create a program and writing subroutines. So every day I went back, I just sort of developed that knowledge till I got to a point where there was a couple of lab experiments and I thought, oh, I don't fancy this. So I went to the library, looked up the formulas for how these worked, went back at lunchtime, tried to program the formulas in and eventually got there. And so I just got a set of data that I could just plot on a piece of graph paper with the results. So I didn't need to do the lab experiment. I could just do it from a simulation in 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 the in the PDPA. I mean looking back, I mean it was an immense technological achievement. And what was it? It was a it had 8K of memory. And inside the 8K of memory they managed to write a five user basic system. We had five terminals. I think we had three in the main room and two on across the corridor. And um, it just then sort of took over because I saw it as a massive utility tool. Can you describe it? You described it physically. I mean, what was the sense of, I suppose, it, what was it like to use? I mean, people would look at this today and maybe be confused by a lack of a keyboard or a lack of a screen, but this was all very advanced for its time, wasn't it? Still, comparatively speaking. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, looking back, it, it was, it was the really the precursor to the mini computer that everybody else had. I mean, they, they'd managed to deliver something at a price point where a college like ours could afford it. Um, the exact configuration, I'm not 100% sure of now, but I think we had 8K of memory, which is the expanded version. Uh, and when I say K, it's K words, because it was 12-bit, which is also an interesting architectural thing. I, I, I spent time, they, he gave me all the manuals. I had all the circuit diagrams to look at. And that's where my interest in creating computers came from, because when the engineer would come to service it, I'd try and sneak off and actually be there and watch him do it and actually understand how you maintain some piece of technology like that. But to use it, it was very, you had to create everything. It was very bland, you know, all this Windows drag and drop stuff was, you know, tens of years in the future because we just didn't have the compute power. The compute power was solely about the calculations that it was going to do. Mm. 
So this is, so how many years are you at Bolton Institute of Technology for this? Just just two. So two years and every lunchtime you're in there using yeah, the machine. Yeah, pretty much. What's happening to your actual coursework at this point? Oh no, no, course, coursework was fine. And the reason the coursework was fine was, was that um, I'd actually figured that, you know, within a fairly short space of time, I thought this is really cool. But the college didn't have any more of it. And I found out with a bit of research that Manchester University was like an epicenter of computer hardware. And so I started to make a plan, right? I'm at a college in Bolton. How do I get into computer science at Manchester University? What do I have to do to get there? Because that is going to be the next place because there I could be taught by, you know, people like Tom Kilburn, who was, is, is essentially the father of modern computing. I mean, his papers on the one level storage system still hold true today. So I think it was, it, is, it was a turning point. It was a massive turning point because rather than being force fed stuff that I had no idea what I wanted to do, I actually then had a plan and a target and I was actually pulling information out of other people, going to see the head of department say, I want to go to Manchester University after I finish the course here. And they go, how do you do that? And they say, we don't know, but let's look at it. So to what you did in the decade, the PDP-8 was a massive turning point. Your experience, that was the turning oh, point. I, I think I, think I, would, I would definitely say that, that that opportunity that Graham gave me was the turning point of my life. It turned me, it turned my focus into something I wanted to spend my life understanding. Because I saw you could, it was a, it was a piece of technology that you could develop to do anything almost you wanted. I mean, as we know now, what we can do with computers is, is fantastic. But then it was a really simple computer, but the, the rules still applied. If you could think of algorithmically how to do something, it would do it for you. And this is, uh, this is uh, Graham is an important figure in this, isn't he? Can you Absolutely. describe him? What, what was he like as a person? Can you physically describe him to us, picture for well, us? Well, he was, yeah, he was, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard now because I've never been good at dating people. But I mean, I think he was, I think he was um, in his, he was probably only in his late 20s, right? I mean, I was a 16, 16 going on 17 year old. He was in his late twenties. Obviously, computers were, were the thing. He was always very casually dressed, very, and he was, apart from defending the computer against people, he was, you know, he was a very affable sort of guy. He was always happy to help. He had a sort of shock black hair. I'm trying to think of somebody I could, you know, I could probably um, equivalent him to, but not not immediately. I can't really. I mean, it's funny how when you get to interact with somebody so closely, you forget what they look like. It's that interaction that's more important. I desperately went through every photograph I could find for Bolton Institute to try and find a photograph of him. But I think he was a bit camera shy. He always seemed to have managed to avoid it or just have his back absolutely to the, to the camera, which is a shame. And I've tried on several occasions to try and locate him just to let him know what a difference he made. But he'd retired at that point and, you know, GDPR has become the bane of our lives. I sent them a letter to pass on. I don't think it ever got passed on. Although it may have got passed on and he just went, ah, oh, no, ah, oh, maybe I don't remember. He doesn't remember. Do you, did you spend, was it every lunchtime with him working on, was it like very much together, collaborative, or was he just give you work? Um, he was there if I needed him. I am quite a um, sort of self-motivated. If, if I've if i got a problem, I'm there, I will work on it. I mean, basically, he often had to throw me out. He said, it's five to two, you're in lectures in five minutes, go on, skedaddle. Um, but no, if I got stuck or I wanted to do something, um, he, you know, he will be there to support, which was great. And sometimes he'd say, I have a clue what you're trying to do. And I've got no idea how to help you. So, you know, he's very honest in that, in that way as well. 
I think the, the the amusing thing is the is the fact that he allowed me to get access to the engineers because I although at programming that first programming was a, a key key point the other thing that came in over those two years was actually getting access to the guts so when the lids were off when you know when the engineer had the hard disks drive out on the table to fix something I was there oh, what's this what's that I think the engineers got a little bit irritated with me. Um, what was it like inside of PDP-8? It's nothing like a computer now, is it? Can you describe what you see oh when you see no, the guts? It's, um, I mean, it was, it was quite beautifully designed, really. It's, um, it was, it's basically there's, there's a core of the interconnect, which is just wire app. And then there's individual cards sat in the side. And I remember them quite well. They sort of had this sort of red, sort of purpley, um, um, sort of handle on the end with the type of the card written on it in white ink. And the problem that you always used to have with it is that they plugged in with gold edge fingers and it seemed that the gold edge fingers would tarnish and that would then cause it to work intermittently. And what he tended to be doing is taking them out, cleaning them, putting them back in, cleaning it, put it back in. And he had this technique of running, I probably shouldn't say this because he'd probably get into trouble, but he used to have a screwdriver and he just used to run the screwdriver along the edge of all the cards after he'd got it working while it was running something like a memory test. And if he ran it across and he got to one and it stopped, he knew that that was still a, a little bit of an iffy connection. Mm. And, you know, he gave me all sorts of techniques for debugging faults in, in, a, in a PDP-8. And in fact, at one point, uh, they were desperate to get it back running. They, they gave me a call and said, can you come have a look and see if you can get it going? Did you experience the deck engineers at all? Yes. What were they like? We hear a lot about the deck engineer, the field sales, the field support. What were they like? Did you talk to them? Oh, yeah. He was, they were really friendly. And in fact, one, in fact, one, again, he probably he said, oh, these set of schematics are getting a bit grubby. I'm going to indent for a new set. There you go. So I had a full set of schematics for it. So then I started to work, work out all the logic, how it all worked. So, to my regret, I lent them to somebody and they never returned them. I mean, it, it just happens. But I, I, still, I still remember them and I can visualise it because all the individual gates were built out of pure transistors. It was all transistors. So if you took out a circuit card, it was transistors and resistors and capacitors. And I suppose the other thing that that, that taught me, and, and I say, I said this to people when they said, oh, computing is really complicated. I said, it's not really. It's a bit like buildings. There are very simple components that then put together in clever ways to make something outstanding. And the transistor is the building block of, of computers. And it's still true today. And this made, this, this made computers so much physically bigger, didn't it, because of the nature of all these components, where it's yes. been shrunk down now, hasn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you've probably, well, you have got more computing power in your Apple Watch by probably a 10,000, maybe even a million orders of magnitude compared with that PDP-8. But that's not the point. A more powerful computer, you can do more quicker. But this was the first, really the first one on the block. And it was the sort of start of, of computing. And of course, then we saw the introduction of the 4004 microcontroller, which was destined originally for a calculator. But then the whole industry just spawned out all the way to things like the DEC Alpha that, that DEC created. So let's, let's talk. So you, you finished at Bolton, or you're about to finish at Bolton, and you're applying quite tact tactically to Manchester University, I think, aren't you? Trying to find a way in there. Well, that's right. And the only course I could actually get on was obviously in electrical and electronic engineering, because that's all my qualifications would actually allow me to do. The slight snag was the matriculation required English language and English, which I hadn't got. I mean, I'd not got a sufficiently high. So I had to then do those as part of my night school in my second year to actually get those, to get the matriculation qualifications to get into Manchester. Again, 
if I hadn't got that target of what I wanted to do, I probably wouldn't have had the impetus to do that. So going to the university, yeah, it was a bit interesting because I applied for the electrical and electronic engineering and during Freshers' Week, before going to any lectures at all, I applied for computer science transfer. That caused a little bit of consternation and, and an interview, but it was actually easy because when I'd explained what I'd done with the PDP-8 and all the things I'd done sort of previously, all the programs I'd written, it, they said yes, they allowed me to transfer, which was hugely important. I mean, I, I dread to think what would have happened if they, if they hadn't done that. I would have had a minuscule amount of computing in an electrical engineering degree, which then I would have had to pivot at the end of a BSc rather than at the beginning. But no, I, I was very fortunate they said yes. So again, another another fortunate twist in in your kind of career. Pro yeah, life my, my my life seems to have been been a been a uh, sort of catalogue of opportunities that seemed so thin to squeeze through. But I, I guess a lot of people's lives are like that. Events happen that allow you to do something that you really want to do. And I think the more you want to do it, the more that maybe the wider that door actually gets. So tell us about Manchester. So you're there, it's a, it's a larger institution than you have been. What's it like at this time? Oh, I mean, so the department was in pretty much a brand new building, which almost looked like a fort. It was sort of vertical column brick. And they had, in the middle of it, they had a courtyard, which had this um, pond, and it had in the middle of it a what looked like a big O in big in sort of white plastic in the middle of this plot in the middle of this pond and the first day I go and they go well, what's that because that doesn't seems a little bit out of place and then they one of the lecturers goes oh that's floating point zero and of course it was a big pun but it took me at least six months into the course before I understood what he was talking about and actually got the joke because floating point numbers was not something I'd done with the PDP-8. I mean, it did it, but I didn't realise. So it was very busy. The, the, the lectures were like four, five, six times the size of what I was used to. The benefit I had is a lot of the electrical and electronic engineering that I'd done stood me in really good stead. And the first year was fairly straightforward because the basic electronics I already knew, the basic gates technology I already knew, some of the computing I'd already done. So you can imagine the second year hit me like a brick wall when they stepped it up, but I managed. And what were you using there at Manchester? What systems are you using? Well, the, the Manchester was um, a sort of a, a three level so the top two levels of the building were computer science. The bottom floor was what was called the regional computer center. And that had ICL machines in, it had a CDC 7600, uh, had a CDC 6600 in there. And it was all the universities collaborate on a timeshare system. So I was, it was... Describe timeshare, what does this mean? Because people were maybe not sure. No, okay. Doing. So. So basically, the, the PDP-8 and its five satellite terminals is a timeshare of sort because you're all sharing the same computer. But this was 100 or 200 people sharing the same computer. So when you typed your bit of code, at some point that computer would run that piece of code and give you the results back. But a large part of our sort of curricula was based on punch cards. So what you would do is you'd write your program on a set of punch cards. You would then submit it overnight to be run on the 6600 or the 7600. And then the next day you get your cards back and your output on a set of line printer paper. So what that did, it was quite interesting, is it made you more thoughtful about your programs. You would sit there, you'd sort of spread out and you'd read them and try and be the computer. 
and try and figure out whether you'd actually made a blunder. Because if you had, it was just going to come back with syntax error and your whole night's worth of running would be, you know, just be futile. Uh, I did make a fatal mistake when I got page feed and line feed confused and was given back a whole box of paper with one character on each page. And they weren't impressed, but they did say, say, well, I don't think you're going to run out of paper for the next two years at university, are you? But, you know, it, it, it happens. And it's a very sobering and quite embarrassing experience because it's quite heavy, a box of line printer paper. But these things happen. And were you using um, any uh, deck systems at uh, Manchester? So in the, in the first year and halfway through the second, no. But then we, so one of the research groups had a PDP-8, which was nice. So I used to go and visit the guy who was running that. And he had a lot of IO interfaces. I mean, I'd not realized that you could interface stuff to a PDP-8 quite so, well, not quite so easily. It really, the really easy interfacing came with the, with the PDP-11, but in so halfway through the, the second year, they started to teach the architecture of the PDP-11, and we actually learned about the instruction set of the PDP. It was part of the taught curricula. So we had, um, I think, three, I think there was three PDP-11s in the department, and we were writing at machine code level. And I, I found it fascinating, the different architectures of computers. When you go back to the PDP-8 with its incredibly lean instruction set, because every instruction was going to cost you so many transistors, they'd really thought about it and it was pared down. And possibly the same view could be taken of the risk machines that we're, we've been building recently. But the, the PDP-11 had this really, I, I don't know quite how to describe it, it was inspired in that all the registers, you could do anything with any of the registers. So your program counter and your stack pointer were part of the register set. So if you just wrote, wrote something, you move something from, uh, and you'll have, my memory's a little bit hazy. I think it was sort of like 70, I think it was, they were called 16 and 17, or what was it, 15 and 16. You moved it to there and your program would suddenly leap off into infinity because you'd changed the program counter. Um, but the thing I really liked about it was the fact that everything was orthogonal. You could do anything. You could do all these instructions. You could do it on anything in those set of registers. Now, everybody said, oh, yeah, well, it was a great architecture, but it was really slow because it was going to memory all the time. But in fact, because you had these registers, if you were using a compiler, it would optimize the nth out of it and it would be really efficient. And that sort of got the performance back. How did you, this is a, this is a major step up for you from the PDP-8. How, oh, yeah. how, how are you finding this? Is it refreshing, a like, revolutionary change for you, do you think? Yeah, I think it was, it's the, it, it's, the, it's the revolution of the new, this new architecture sort of learning about it. In parallel, we're also being taught about really big machines. You know, because the university was building machines in collaboration with ICL. Uh, we had MU5, and that was a huge research computer that we had there. It was one of the very early asynchronous machines. I mean, we could go into the nitty gritty, but basically there's two ways the machines work. They work to a heartbeat or a clock, and everything happens on the clock, or everything happens when it's finished, that causes something else to go off a bit like you know a set of dominoes when that's done it sets the next one off but they're much more complicated to create and they have a lot more potential issues so i was getting the exposure to all sorts of different computer architectures and now talking about architectures we've obviously deck features frequently but you use other systems you mentioned the i think it was the uh, icl system the cdc systems yeah. are you getting a sense now of how they compare is any sense of one's better than the other how deck compares these other systems either from an architecture's 
architect, either from a user perspective, you're the user, but also you've got an engineering mind. How, how do they look to you from an engineering perspective? Is one better than the other, more advanced than the other? I, I think my, my sort of uh, take on that is the CDCs were more of number crunches. The big ICL 1900 were number crunches. They were there for doing, you know, sort of large amounts of data, process it, chuck out the results. Whereas the, the deck machines, certainly the early ones, I mean, pre the Vaxes, they were more interactive and there was this idea that you would interface to them. And this idea that you could interface to that computer was a thing that I really liked. So they were more, um, more immediate, if you like, and more um, accessible, whereas the CDCs and things were just hidden behind a big operating system and it's a set of cards or you were on a type, you had to push programs into it. Um, and that was something for me because I got the electronics background sort of attracted me more to the deck machines. I mean, I'd, I've, you know, over my career, I've seen deck machines used in all sorts of things, interface to humongous amounts of electronics. Uh, in one place, there was what, five, five racks of electronics with a deck computer in the middle that was measuring the quality of glass. We went in and sadly replaced all of that with a PC and a few FPGA cards. But that was a step change. I mean, that was 20 year old technology. We said, and we just crunched it down. That was, and that's what happens. It, I think, I don't think there's another industry where the advances are so rapid that in two or three years, the thing that you've done is seriously obsolete. And of course that was always a challenge. You know, it's a challenge for any company and also as a challenge, I think, for DEC, for trying to keep up with what was happening. But I always felt that the DEC machines were immediate. Less so with the Vaxes, they tended to get back to the timeshare sort of environment. But the, you know, with a, with a PDP-8 or a PDP-11, it was almost, it was your machine. And it was a, almost in a single user, your machine, you make it do your bidding. You're not sharing that time with anybody else whereas on the cdc's you're sharing it with hundreds of other people and you mentioned the interface are you on the 11 are you using like terminals screen terminals to access them or is it your keyboard straight into the PDP oh, we, 11? so we we had a variety it was um when you say terminals i mean the vd you had the you had a bit of a choice you either had a terminal with a paper like the old asr 33s i think these were made by olivetti but um we also had VDUs because they were they were now you know with CRT tubes in obviously, but so they combined with a keyboard. Yeah, I mean the VT VT one hundred terminal, still a keyboard, mm. but also you could interface to them. You could buy interface kits, and then you could get interface hardware. To I never got the opportunity to do that. Just the way that my uh, career path went, I actually ended up leaping all the way through. Right, almost right back to Z80 systems made by research machines. And I was interfacing things to those to interface into large scale computers. That's, that's sort of where my end of my university career went, was building the next generation of high performance computing. So as I was going to ask you, so what do you take away from your time at Manchester? Anything, anything that really sticks in your mind, programs that really stand out, developed using DEC systems or large systems around DEC that you kind of think, yeah, I, I look back on that with fondness or that was an achievement? Um, I, I, think, I, I think the thing is, once I got to university, then the DEC systems were really subsumed into a, a morass of different systems that I had access to. It's hard to pick out. I think the thing that changed is that with the PDP-8, you would do you would boot it in the morning on the hand keys. On the, you know, on the on the uh, PDP-11, you'd just literally just turn it on, and the disks would come up, and the operating system would come up. Um, yeah, it's hard. It 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 sort of, it was a mixture. But I say the, the thing for me that the big takeaway was the immediacy still. 
of the the PDP eight mm. eleven that you could actually interface to it, and it, it was your machine, and you could actually just we actually could just put programs in on the hankies like you could on on the on the eight. But I think um, you know we started to get very quickly. We got um, a thing called an ICL perk, which was the computer with the interactive, really high performance interactive graphics on it. And then everybody's attention turns to those because they were much more fun. And a lot of my software development after my first degree was done on those machines because they were just, sadly, they were just better for what I needed to do. So I was going to pick up and say, so you, you graduate from Manchester and you go on, are you now moving away from deck systems at this point on a yeah, I mean, the problem, the problem is, is I'd moved into hardware, so physically creating computers. So the use of the deck equipment sort of disappeared and dissipated. So that probably is where I started to detach myself, if you like, from the, from the, from the deck um, story. I mean, I had been over to UMIST and they had a, they had a, a deck 10, which was quite a, quite a beast. But in terms of the power and performance of the other stuff that we then had access had access to, it was losing ground rapidly. So where do you go to? Your your career takes off. Your your jobs after university. What what happens? Well, so so I spent some time giving back at the university. I became a lecturer in computer science. Did that for a number of years, uh, but then. It was actually, again, it was interfacing into a computer that got me out of there. A guy came up to me after an open day. I'd built, it was really fairly simple. It was just a, a camera, a frame store, and then output to a terminal. And what it did is it took a black and white image. It did a, a color video lookup, converted it into a sort of false color image. But that for, I did that because that's something that would attract the general public they sort of understood what was going on but they thought you know it was my super cheap version of a quantel paint box right i think it cost i think the total bill of materials cost was something like 110 pounds i'd spent on it and a lot of wire wrapping over several weeks to get it together but a guy said oh, i need a commercial version of that will you will you do one for me i went to see the prof and he said well yeah i guess you can but then the drag of those creative commercial projects just got the better of me. I mean, projects at university would take months and months and months. These were like bish, bash, bosh. You know, I want it and I need it next week or the week after. And so that immediacy and the speed of that quite appealed to me because, again, it was another challenge, not only to do it right, but to do it quickly. And so I eventually left. I spent two years at another company trying to learn the ropes of business because I'd never done anything with business to try and get an understanding. Then I set up on my own as a computer consultant, built a business, uh, sold that business and then started the one I still run today. Which is the one you run today? Yeah, the one, it's Norcott Technologies up in uh, Widness we are in now. So uh, yeah, and, and what we do is basically we build hardware platforms for people to put smart software on. Let's talk about the obvious sort of the almost the elephant in the room as it were. So Raspberry Pi is now starting to is obviously in your life. So how did how did that come about? What was because you mentioned the guy came up to you there and wanted you to build something for him. Yes. Is that kind of how does Raspberry Pi start so, emerging? So ever since I think probably as I left university I realized that a lot of people had done a lot of things for me, especially Graham. He'd given me that opportunity and that encouragement. And I thought, you know, how can I give that back? Well, the way to give it back is to, to pay it forward and do it for other kids. And, you know, we had a conversation, you know, I have this conversation. I also have this thing about, I think the education system has a strata that works really well. But if you're above or below that strata, you struggle. And I, I felt I struggled with that. And I'm not going to ever say whether I was above or below it, but I struggled with it. And I'm thinking, if, if outside of that environment, 
you could have that opportunity, then you might find computer science to be the thing that you're interested in or computer engineering. But I couldn't find any way of expressing that in a, in a meaningful way until I went down to Imperial College. We'd built a big piece of electronics for them and they said, do you want to come down and see it working? And I thought, do I? It's, it's London, it's a bit of a trek. No, I will go because, you know, it's, it's always interesting to see the things that you've built actually working. A lot of the stuff that we do, we never hear of again. Um, so I went and it was like a, it was a, a sort of a seminar day. But I just call it a show and tell. People were showing and telling the, the research that we're doing. And I sat next to this guy, didn't know who he was. And at lunch, we walked over Hyde Park and we just got chatting and it turned out he was professor of computer science at Cambridge and I was saying I'm struggling with the fact that a lot of engineers are coming to apply for jobs who've never actually debugged a bit of circuitry before because they don't make anything and he was saying well we've got a similar problem in computer science where we've got students arriving who've never actually chosen a program for themselves written that program, debugged it, and actually achieved the goal of making that thing that they intended work. And he said, we've got an idea that, that the problem is that things like the BBC Micro, the ZX Spectrums and ZX81s have all basically been annihilated by the arrival of this beast, the PC, because they're sort of secondary um, business model was to give you some sort of business software and that sort of kept afloat but also allowed them then to go to the hobbyists and the makers and the people who were really interested in in the technology and so we were really in the situation well yeah that sounds like it could work and so it was what 2008 and we sort of, I went to a meeting in Cambridge. Uh, we was just sat in a little room. There was just a group of, uh, there was seven of us. And we just said, we just got to do this. We just got to give this a go. What were you, did you know what you were talking about at this point? Did you have any sense of the Raspberry Pi? It's still no, very abstract. No, 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 we were just, we were at that, at that particular moment, all we were thinking about it was a small computer you could give to under, pre-undergraduates to say, go do something useful with this, come back, and then you can talk lucidly about what you've done with it. And I thought, that'd be great. I could send that out to people who were applying for engineering jobs with me, say, interface something useful to that, come back and talk to me about it. Because that's far more informative for me than a CV. You can write what you like on a CV. The proof is whether you can actually do it physically and actually make this thing work. There's, you know, there's this whole, I think it was, uh, you know, it was this thing that uh, Steve Jobs, I, there was an interview and he said, uh, the problem is there's a huge amount of craftsmanship between an idea and a physical product. And that's the bit that I'm massively interested in and always been interested in is how you take that idea and you actually turn it into its physical form and then get it to work at, you know, and there's so many constraints, you know, price point and physical size and all this sort of stuff. But that's all part of the challenge. So, yeah, so I said, well, look, you know, I build electronics. I said, I'm no good with the software, but I build electronics. It's my day job. I'm sure we can squeeze a few of these through our production line with no problem. So I offered to build these, what was then going to be 3,000. That was the maximum. We thought we needed 3,000 over four or five years. Did you have a diagram? Like, did you, did you have product in mind? The, no, not nothing. the hardware, anything? No, we had, a, we had a very basic concept. And the very basic concept was to emulate essentially what something like a, um, well, like a, a PDP-8 did and also BBC Micro. It sits there with a the prompt and you've got to type things in. 
and the idea is it would run Python because that was a more modern language. Um, and there would be some limited scope for interfacing, maybe, maybe not, because their focus was more on the writing of the programs. My sort of side focus on interfacing it to other bits of electronics. And it was that marry, that marriage, if you like, of that thought and their thought that eventually, because this was 2008, and it then took us till 2011 to get to a prototype Raspberry Pi. And it had all those features. But the big evolution between that initial meeting and the first prototype is we had an ARM core on the device and really nice graphics so we could run a version of Linux. And that just explodes the horizon of opportunities. It goes from being, you've got to type everything in yourself to, oh, there's a library that will do this for me. And I can bolt this together and I can do this and I can do that. And there was a huge amount of work to try and figure out how we could make this Linux computer for $35. We had really nailed our credentials to the masthead I have to admit, I wasn't necessarily at that point saying we absolutely could do it. But that's where the charitable side of it, we realized that if we tried to do this as a business, it was going to do two things. One, it was going to send the wrong message because this was a mission about giving people opportunity. And also, it was about, you know, getting people to come along and join this marathon of a mission and actually help us. So when we went out for components for it, we said, well, we don't want you to give them to us. That's no good to us. We want you to perhaps just give us a good price point, like maybe the million piece price or the price you'd give to Apple or the price you'd give to Sony or somebody like that. And if you do that, we'd be happy with that and we can work with that. And quite a lot of people did. Quite a lot of people didn't. Some people believed in the mission instantly because they could see where we were going. Others just thought, nah. So, but it was all stems from the fact that I wanted to give other, ultimately give other kids the opportunity that I'd had because it had been so life-changing for me. And I suppose, yeah, I mean, probably a little bit big headed to think that it would at that point that it would make a difference. But I had to try. I had to try and do something that would give other kids the opportunity like I had to give them a choice. And I'm not saying they have, you know, you don't have to be interested in computers, but if you try it and you are, then it's a win. If you try it and you're not, I also argue that that's a win as well, because you know what you're not interested in. Mm. How is interesting in the in the survey which you which you took part on um, you said obviously the interaction, the assistance of the of, of te the, te the technician at Bolton transformed the course of, of your life and eventually led to the creation of the Raspberry Pi. Obviously, that much is obvious with with Graham, who stepped in at a very important moment. You know, sliding doors world, you could be anywhere other than here right now. But I'm curious to find out um, in what way can we say, or would you say, the either the PDP eight influenced the Raspberry Pi? Is there a direct technical heritage there? You keep talking about the interface aspect, which you said they were very, they were very in, to create a word, interfaceable, weren't they, the DEC system? Yes. Is it the interface? Is it the usability? Uh, was it the, or was it more kind of the concept of opportunity that it presented? Is it any way we could say, yes, the system lives on today in the Raspberry Pi, either from a conceptual or a technical perspective? Um, yeah, I think, I think there are, there are several things. I think the first thing, is, I know it sounds a bit weird, but it's this personable thing. It's your computer. It's doing your bidding. Nobody else is involved with it. That was very much, although it was a multi-user system, you could actually take it over and it could just be yours. And that was, I think, the thing of the, the, the deck that I really quite liked about. It felt as though it was yours. And you could, you type your program, you type run, you could look over, you could see that through the lights. I mean, you, you do the control C and it all sort of, largely stop. So 
there was that sort of part of it. You're right, the interfacing was another thing because, you know, when you look at the environment, computers are everywhere. You just don't realize they're there because they're doing a job, they're doing a function. They're not being a computer. They're being the heart of some other piece of electronics. And so I feel that's very important because that's a whole opportunity for creativity that doesn't look like a computer, but does things by using a computer. So this is the tool aspect. And I always felt that the, the PDP-8 and the DEC systems were a really good tool. So yeah, I guess it lives on. But I mean, the problem always with this is that the technology goes so fast. So the graphics and things that we can do on the Pi, there's no really direct equivalent on, you know, in, in the DEC world. So I, I, I think for me, it's the foundations that it built, the bits of technology. There's little bits of deck in all the things that I've done from where I started because of what it taught me back then. Those little bits sort of, sort of weave the way through everything I've done. So I, you know, yeah, it's in there, but if, Deck hadn't, if you think about it, if Deck hadn't invented that computer, made it at a price point that was affordable for a college that gave me the opportunity, then I'm, well, I'm certain that Pi wouldn't exist because that was such a, you know, something else may have come out. I mean, what we say is if one door opens, the other door's closed. You just don't know. But I, you know, I do believe that, that their sort of, um, mission to make an affordable computing system that was interfaceable was a was a key moment in in probably in computing itself and then of course you've got microcontrollers and microcomputers and they all, all have the interfacing capability then that sort of went a bit weird when you got to the pc and then it's all come back again with things like the raspberry pi and probably hundreds of others now that, that emulate what raspberry pi did the reason we built Raspberry Pi is because nothing, we could see nothing that was that, comp that part that we needed in order to give us that educational tool. Because the thing that we did realize is that how we're going to compete with Grand Theft Auto and all these other games that the kids were consuming. And one of the ways was to make the computing physical. So you add the Raspberry Pi, some electronics, a few bits of plastic, a few bits of motors, and you've got a robot. And they're hugely attractive. Even I was at an event just a few days ago and there were robots everywhere because they're great fun and they're massively interactive. And there's also, you could see in some of these robots, the personality of the people that had created them and the way that they thought about, about that. So yeah, no, I mean, deck, you know, I suppose you could, you know, you could say without deck, that foundation, then yeah, Raspberry Pi wouldn't exist. But it's, it's, it's not like a really thick strand. It's like a wire that's been, it, it, it sort of influences everything that I've probably done. Just mentioned, um, just kind of curious to find out if you could explain to us. First of all, the professor at Cambridge University, just his name, you said you met him at that meeting. So that was Alan Mycroft. Okay. And, you, and, and the other thing was, I was going to ask you, do you think, um, you mentioned why, how you both, both agreed, both faced this problem. You had engineers who were coming to you, didn't know how to debug hardware. He had, um, I suppose, uh, computer science people who didn't know how to debug applications. Um, today, the world has moved on so much. Everything is so much cloud-based, downloadable. You don't need to know that stuff almost. And yet, wh why, is it, why does it remain important to know that stuff rather than outsourcing the knowledge to somebody else? Yeah, that's a tricky one. And I'm just going to have to mess up with this and just have a quick. So it is important because we're going to be in an environment where everybody takes the technology for granted. You can almost imagine a situation where Everything's cloud-based, everything's working, and the AI is helping to keep it all running, but one day it just stops. 
who's going to fix it? If you don't understand how it works, you can't fix it. And you see this a little bit in the automotive industry that when I was a kid, you know, we'd be driving along and my dad say, hmm, better get the points sorted. It's misbehaving and we'd be under the bonnet and we'd, we'd fix it. Now you've almost got the situation where there's a piece of plastic and it's imprinted in the top. Abandon your credit card, anybody who enters here because it'll be a thousand pounds, 10,000 pounds to fix whatever you break. And you can't fix it because you don't understand how it works. It's all just too complicated. We run a severe risk of making all this technology that complicated that nobody understands how it works. And in fact, we have a little bit of that problem with AI now because people say well, it makes decisions, but we have no idea. We're ultimately gonna have to get back on top of that in some way. Because if we don't, we're never going to be able to fix it. We're never going to be able to repair it. And also, we're not going to be able to develop and innovate on top of it. So it is hugely important that we have a subset of the population that are still engineers developing technology, understanding how it works, understanding how it could be modified better for societal good. Because ultimately, that's what we need to do. I mean, technology needs to help to fix the issues that we've got. We also have a shortage, a shortage of software engineers and hardware engineers, don't we? Oh, it's a huge shortage. I think it's because people don't see it as a career opportunity. And I think it's partially we need to we need to give them the opportunity to get the bug. There is a sort of once you get into it and you realize the expansive nature, it's almost like the TARDIS, right? You, you look at it and go, hmm, yeah, whatever. And then you open the door and there's this expansive level of creativity inside there, an opportunity that unless you're given the opportunity to open that door, you won't see. And the kids of today don't see it because where do we, where do we expose them to it? Where do we give them the opportunity to see how this technology is created? And the answer, well, one of the answers is through what we do with Raspberry Pi and the outreach we do. And there's, you know, there's other great um, programs to try and do the same. And, and we are probably always going to have a shortage of engineers. But that's, you know, unless we, unless we actually work hard to say, look, this is a career, it's rewarding, it's something that you really can enjoy doing, then where do we go? We end up with nobody that can fix anything, nobody that can innovate anything, and eventually all that technology is, is going to die in some way. So it is a huge problem, and it's a huge problem we need to be on top of. And that's why I've spent, what, 16 years trying to help get on top of it. So why, in a nutshell, why should people be learning to get to the hardware, to the software, to get down to the roots of these systems? It's really so you understand how it works. So you have some knowledge about these things that are around you. I mean, you can arbitrarily say, I don't care, I'll just take my car to the garage. And the technician will fix it. Ah, oh, no, but the people who invented this have retired. We have no idea. All we can do is replace your car. Is it career changing? Is it life changing? Obviously, your exposure to the roots of technology changed your life and your career, didn't they? We did. Um, I think. I think it would. It has. A, I think everything has an opportunity to change people's lives. It's being open to that change, and being open to trying to discover. I guess what floats your boat. What really gets you out of bed in the morning. What excites you? And I'm sure there are thousands, of, well, maybe tens of thousands of kids out there who if we actually got exposure to electronics and computers in that way, would want to be involved in it. Just 
looping back back to a sort of a few thoughts on deck you experienced their engineers you experienced their their computers from they obviously no longer exist um did you ever any sense of it was like a very much an, an engineering led company from what you'd seen going on under the covers of, of the technology and the people you spoke to yeah i always i always felt it was an engineering company and they'd they pushed the bounds again trying to keep current with with the with the alpha I was very fortunate to get a visit up to air to actually see the alpha machines being built. And I thought they've got, you know, they've got a fantastic opportunity here. But of course it got derailed. Um, I think, I'm not completely sure, I'm not that well up on the demise of alpha, but I think it was Microsoft decided to stop supporting something that then made it less appealing. I mean, and you also think, is this, is this something, it's a repeat of something I've heard before when the, you know, sort of the, the BBC micros and the, the Spectrums became unappealing because the core piece of technology that kept them going disappeared, always subsumed into something else. So yeah, it's, uh, I always believed, it always seemed to be a technology. I mean, the thing I, I mean, going right back to the days, I look at the, all the stuff the, you know, all the schematics and stuff. It was created by passionate engineers trying to do something really cool. And they, I think, largely achieved it. Obviously, again, it's, it's the company's long gone now. And, um, and you've kind of it's hinted at what you think its legacy or the threads are in, in the Raspberry Pi. In a larger sense, do you have any perspective or thought on if DEC has a legacy to the world in general, either what culturally or direct technical routes of what you see around us today? That's a really, I mean, that's a really hard one. I mean, at the end, I think the end of everything is, they were creators of the early technology of, of computers. They were, you know, they were in there vying against the IBMs and the CDCs of this world and in a different space. But they were create that creativity that they had spawned engineers that then went off and did other things. So, you know, they're they are part of the roots of the technology. Things that they did would then appear somewhere else. So they pervade, I think DEC pervade the modern technology, as I said, in little fine strands that go out across the technology. And without them, I mean, like I say. You know, without them, would somebody else have filled that void? It's hard to know. For me, I think, you know, I think they're one of the founding, you know, it's a founding companies of, certainly with the way you interact with the, the computers, the way you use the computers. They were there laying the foundations of things that you could do, but then obviously got burnt away because of price points and technologies and yeah, sadly, everything changes, everything grows up, everything develops. And, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on exactly how it all fell apart. And it, it's sad that it has, but I think that's, that's the, just the momentum of change. What was it that, that but made- But the legacy can't, you, you can't take away that legacy. What was, that, what was it that you said was the foundation of computing? Was it the computing power or the usability they presented people or other aspects? I think it's the usability, the thought that went into them, some of the creativity in architectures. may not have been the best, but it made you think and gave you an opportunity to actually, you know, they thought about, they thought about interfacing. I suppose that's why I was attracted to it. They thought about interfacing and it was much easier in the, in the PDP-11s and using the memory space to actually address your peripherals. Now, modern microprocessors do that. Did DEC actually cause modern microprocessors to do that? It's hard to know, but they could have done. I mean, if I really tried to dig down, can we find a thread between, the micro, between what DEC did on a PDP-11 and what modern microprocessors have done with the way that they interface? I can't. I honestly can't say without digging, but I, you know, I think there's a good possibility it does. So that's why I feel that there is some foundation. There's a foundation of what DEC, DEC have done 
then has laid foundations for other developments. And if you think about that's what technology does. We feed off each other's. What is the statement? Is standing on the shoulders of giants. And so certainly in its day, DEC was a giant and people will have definitely stood on their shoulders.